back at the president's first year from the rocky rollout of the travel ban to the triumphant passage of his historic tax overhaul here with a look at his accomplishments and setbacks as Wall Street Journal columnist and deputy editor Dan Henniger, columnist Kim Strassel and Mary Anastasia O'Grady and assistant editorial page editor James Freeman. All right, uh, Dan. So let's start with Trump uh, uh, the year and the Republican Congress, too. Uh, uh, how do you size it up? Uh, let's look at the high points. Oh, the high points? Well, we would start at the end, of course, with the uh, Tax Reform Act of 2017. That was a very high point. The highest point at the beginning was the confirmation of Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. And uh, I suppose we should also mention that uh, there were all of the uh, regulatory rollbacks of Obama's regulations using the Congressional Review Act. Uh, but once past that point in the beginning, through the end, uh, there weren't a lot of real high points because they spent most of the middle of the year trying to reform Obamacare. That was a failure. But, um, you know, they've gone off on a true high. The economy is strong. Tax Reform Act should probably propel that economy, so they've got the winds at their back going into 2018. We do want to talk about the economy uh, in, in more detail later, Mary, but I think the deregulatory agenda is really uh, both what Congress did with Congressional Review Act. It had only been used once before. I think they've used it 13 or 14 times this year. But what they did in the agencies, Trump's agencies, with this idea of a regulatory budget, if you're going to add a regulation, you better get rid of of others. I think that that is an unsung triumph this year. Right, and I think that goes also to another big accomplishment, which is the people he put in some of these places were so key. People like Scott Pruitt at the EPA, Scott Gottlieb at the uh, FDA, um, and it's sort of an awareness that the hostility to business, almost as much as the, 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 the actual regulations, but the overriding message from the Obama administration that basically business was a problem, um, that reversal, I think, has made a big difference in the economy this year. All right, James, uh, I'm going to come to you for the low points, or at yeah. least some of them, What's, because I think there's this paradox here, right? You got these sort of these successes, accomplishments, uh, 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 Congress, but then why is he under 40 percent in the polls? How do you explain that? Yeah, I think his, if you could say the big failure of the year in contrast to the substantive accomplishments is his failure to uh, sell himself politically to uh, the American people. He's Especially still, swing voters. He's still uh, bumping along, and, and I think a lot of it is, uh, despite uh, what is turning out to be a pretty significant record of achievement in year one, he often says things that uh, even his supporters wish he didn't say, tweets things they wish he didn't tweet. And, and he's given, I think, a, it's a historically hostile media, but he's also given them an opening to attack him with a lot of, we'll say, imprecise uh, statements. Uh, some people say lies. <laughs> I, I would say often uh, it's, uh, he is being judged by a higher standard, but uh, he needs to be more accurate, I think, if he wants to avoid uh, uh, handing a, a sword to his enemies in the new year. Kim, I guess I'd point as well to some of the chaos in the White House of the early part of his presidency and the travel ban. I think they've had three of them so far, two of them thrown out in court. Might ultimately the third might probably be upheld by the Supreme Court, but the question is, did you need that message, particularly right out of the, the blocks? Uh, and then I think just the White House staff, you know, anybody could walk in there at any time for the first two or three months and say, hey boss, what's doing? And uh, put anything on his desk. Now, John Kelly's come in and as chief of staff and imposed some order, but, you know, not, not total. Yeah, but I don't think it gets the notice that it probably deserves, Paul, in that if you look at the first six months of this administration versus the last six months, it's almost night and day in terms of the stories that are coming out, the palace intrigue. Remember, the beginning of this was this death match between Steve Bannon and Reince Priebus, uh, everybody angling to get their initiatives in front of the president to bring the other one down with leaks to the press. Uh, Kelly came in, that is mostly stopped. Uh, he also got some other people in working around that are, are seem to be functioning on making the presidency work and be thoughtful about policies and their rollout so you don't have another travel ban problem. Um, you know, so now at this point, it's, it's, it's more a question of how do you control the president himself? The internal workings seem to be generally on track. That's the, uh, the million dollar question. How do you 
control the president. So I don't think you're ultimately ever going to do that entirely, Dan. No, I don't think so. He'll keep tweeting. Uh, I think some of the uh, tweets and the Twitter use of Twitter could be more productive, talking about his accomplishments, because just as James was suggesting, he is dealing with a hostile media. There is one other element that I think is worth noting. Trump's approval is down below for it's about 38 percent. That's the lowest for any president in about the fast since the 1950s. Bill Clinton was at about 57 percent in December. But we have an historically polarized electorate. Right. Republicans approve Trump by 80 percent. Democrats, it's 7 percent. And independents, it's around 40 percent. But you have a country that is completely torn apart. And you do have a lot of the media over there on the side of the Democrats. So this is an uphill battle for uh, for Donald Trump. Let's talk a little bit uh, about foreign policy, uh, because I think that a high point probably was his uh, statement with the firing of missiles again when Syria used chemical weapons. In contrast to Obama, he said, you can't do that. Uh, uh, and yet so much of the rest on foreign policy is a work in progress. We don't know what's going to happen on North Korea. We don't know what's going to happen on Syria, for example, that we're still waiting. Well, he's made some really important gains against ISIS, and I think that's his big win for the year. But um, uh, one of the problems I think that he has on foreign policy is he doesn't understand the economic engagement that's important. I mean, giving away the Trans-Pacific Partnership basically left China to write its own uh, ticket for trade in, um, in Asia. And uh, he wants to destroy NAFTA. I think that's also a, a big negative for him and makes him unpopular with so many people who would normally be supporters, but they see their jobs at risk. And he also has, I think, uh, made a big mistake by characterizing immigration as a liability to the United States. Well, there, now there you opened up at the last second here. That was a large debate. All right, when we come back after a rancorous year in Washington, President Trump and Republican leaders say they're optimistic they can work with Democrats in 2018 on some common policy goals. So from infrastructure to immigration, we'll take a look at the prospects for bipartisanship next. If infrastructure can be bipartisan. Well, I think one thing you can say about this year, it was pretty partisan. I don't think most of our Democratic colleagues want to do nothing. And there are areas, I think, where we can get bipartisan agreement. President Trump and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell striking an optimistic tone after a bitterly partisan year in Washington. So from infrastructure to immigration, are there opportunities for cooperation with Democrats in 2018 as Republicans try to push forward with their agenda? Let's turn to Mr. Optimist himself, James Freeman. <laughs> do, we, uh, do we really think uh, uh, that there's a shot here and what are they going to work on? Infrastructure, really? Well, optimism is kind of a funny uh, term in this context because when you talk about infrastructure for taxpayers, the optimistic uh, hope is often don't do anything, don't spend any more money. And I I think that's the the danger here is that a bipartisan deal uh, it like uh, previous transportation appropriations bills like the Obama 2009 yeah. stimulus uh, becomes a, a raid on the taxpayer Let, let's hope not but uh, well uh, and just just to the point James uh, the Democrats want to spend public money on infrastructure right. they don't want to have float bonds that you can leverage some public money with more private financing they just want you sir to write a big yes. check yeah, and and that's the danger in in uh, in seeking a deal here. I, I hope uh, the president is focused on on streamlining. Uh, if he does anything with infrastructure, making it easier to build things in the U.S. again, so you don't have a decade of environmental impact statements and uh, various permitting hassles. Well, you know, it's an interesting political question. If uh, the economy strengthens, jobs continue to be created, that would be the moment to do infrastructure. When the economy's healthier. But if Chuck Schumer tells his union supporters, we're not going to do business with this guy, wait till we take control of the government, then we'll do infrastructure. I think a lot of these unions are going to say, I don't know, we're going to buy that deal. Trump helped the coal industry, and this is the moment to get those jobs while you have a bird in the hand. So I think there could be pressure on the Democrats to do a deal. I think, uh, uh, Mary, there's a chance on immigration. You've got the DACA bill the Democrats want, and uh, maybe combine that with some border enforcement to get a possible deal. There could be a deal on a, on a de minimis financial reform of the kind that's been moving in a bipartisan fashion in the Senate. Not going to repeal Dodd-Frank, but maybe a portion of it 
particularly for smaller banks. I don't know that there's much else bipartisan. No, I think that I think the Democrats are going to want to obstruct, and they see that as a way to win big in November. It, they can say that the president didn't accomplish anything, and um, in particular, you know, on things like uh, DACA, they, I think they'll try to use immigration against him uh, unless he makes some kind of a big concession there, where he, you know, accepts these children in return for the wall. Even there, I think he's going to have a lot of trouble. Well, and I think it's uh, Kim. Uh, I, I don't know. Do you think that there's any more cause for uh, uh, bipartisanship here anywhere uh, going forward? Look, what do Democrats care most about right now? Winning the House and the Senate right. next year. So the, the fundamental question they're asking themselves is, do they greater their, make their chances better by passing something that Americans want, by working with Republicans, or do they do it by rallying their base, getting them excited and getting them to turn out? Which means Most opposing Democrats everything, right, Kim? Beginning. Kim, that means opposing just exactly. about everything. Exactly. That's right. That's how you, you, you resist. You resist. Uh, this is also what the ascendant wing of the Liberal Party wants, the progressive wing. So I, I think that those forces are just so strong that it would be very unlikely that they will step up to do something in a bipartisan and, fashion. And I think, yeah, I think Kim's right. And this is why Mitch McConnell is telling Paul Ryan, basically, we're not going to try to go after any of the big really big entitlement programs this year because Mitch McConnell is famous for saying if you want to govern you first have to win elections so he's thinking a lot about <laughs> and with only 15 they lost a seat in Alabama so there's only 15 15 Senate uh, Republicans and James as I look at the sort of the left-wing intelligentsia mm -hmm. their conclusion of year one is resistance works we're, Trump is down uh, mid 30 you know upper 30s uh, hey that's great we're poised to take back the house and the senate this is beautiful you know we'll repeal the tax cuts forget about that we'll re-regulate when we get back power don't worry about that all of this is ephemeral just keep resisting yeah well they have to ignore the results of the special elections uh, this year for uh, house seats but uh, it, and they also have to ignore uh, Trump's uh, record of achievement as historic tax cut. I, I think yeah, the problem... Yeah, but we'll repeal that. Don't, but, worry, don't, don't worry about it. And, and politically, <laughs> they, they still have him down there at 40%. I, I think the problem for them is can they sustain uh, being the party of resistance of essentially uh, uh, the opponents of the American economic revival if it uh, continues as it has lately? Can they, can they hold out for six, eight, ten months if the economy continues to grow, if it continues to perform at a higher level and create jobs, I, I think that's not a good position for them to be in as, as the cranks essentially uh, talking down yeah, an I economy mean, that's getting better. I mean, fundamentally, they have to hope for bad, something bad to happen to the American people. <laughs> well, look, in November, the Democratic National Committee had its worst fundraising month in nine years. There is a lot of internal dissension inside the Democratic Party over how far that party has gone left. And that includes some <clears throat> people in Congress you would call progressives who are very upset. And I think the Democratic Party's internal fights are going to be something to watch in 2018. Kim, briefly, how, what does the president have to do to get his approval rating up? I mean, obviously, the tax bill, we hope, you know, he, he hopes will help. The question is, though, uh, uh, what does he need to do and how does he need to behave this year to have those melt back up to at least to the mid 40s? One of the biggest things that ever matters to a presidency and its approval ratings are just the economy. So if you begin to see the effects of a tax cut, people feeling more money in their pockets and optimism, that could help. But look, he's going to have to sell his policies and, as James said, put more focus on using those tweets to help himself rather than hurt himself. And that's just something I'm not sure this president has the ability to do. All right. Thank you all. Still ahead, fresh off their Senate victory in Alabama, Democrats are looking ahead to the 2018 midterms with increasing optimism. But are predictions of a blue wave premature? Larry Sapps and Trump's approval rating hovering in the high 30s. Democrats are feeling optimistic about their chances in both the House and Senate. So what should we expect heading into the midterm campaign? Earlier, I spoke to Larry Sabato. He's director of the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia. Welcome, Larry Sabato. Good to have you with us. Now, we are, are entering 2018, and the Democrats I took to talk to are already saying we're going to pick up the House and probably the Senate next November. Is their optimism warranted? 
They're on a sugar high after <laughs> Doug Jones went in, went in Alabama and also Ralph Northam's big win in Virginia. Yeah. But you know, a lot can happen in 10 months. We all know that. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to wait and see. I think Democrats certainly will pick up seats. It's a midterm election. Right. And uh, you, that normally means the opposition party picks up seats. But when you're looking at the head to head polling right now, OK, not 10 months from right now, Democrats have something like an eight to 10 point advantage in the polling number of who which, who should run Congress. That's a big advantage. You also have about a 10 point advantage in enthusiasm with their voters versus Republicans. That usually means big pickups. Yes, if that holds, if that holds, they will win the House and they might be able to stave off any defeats in the Senate, which is incredible when you think about it, because they're defending 26 seats, 10 of them in states that President Trump won in 2016. The Republicans have only eight seats up on the ballot and only two of them are vulnerable. So I would say if Democrats held their own poll, they'd be doing extraordinarily well. If it's a giant wave, right. yeah, they'll they'll win the Senate too, but I'm talking about a giant wave. Okay, now it's, We're not there yet. All right, so what might change? Well, one thing that just changed, we now have this tax <clears throat> bill. And if the, the, the Republicans are clearly enthused about that, they think this is going to help them as the, their paychecks show up. How do you see that affecting psychology in the election? We're in such a partisan age, Paul, that I can see the Republican voters who would have voted Republican anyway saying, yep, that tax bill is terrific and I'm doing better. I can feel it already. And the Democrats will all say, huh, where's my money? It all went to corporations. It all went to the rich. Now, the one difference it could make if Republicans are right in their analysis of the tax bill, if then Republican voters may be able to close at least some of this enthusiasm gap, which does exist. The Democrats have an enthusiasm uh, edge for 2018, just like Republicans ended up having the enthusiasm edge for 2016. Now, the other thing that Republicans are touting is the growth of the economy. This uh, fourth quarter of 2017 looks like we're going to come in at about 3% growth. Again, that would make three quarters in a row if the tax bill helps and the economy continues to, to uh, expand at that kind of a pace, which we haven't seen for any extended period for a lot of years, how will that play in the election? It's bound to help some Republicans. Here's the problem that Republicans have. Already close to 60% of Americans say the economy is either good or excellent. In some polls, it's the highest percentage in many, many years having that positive of view. But at the very same time, President Trump is at 35, 37, 41%, depending on the survey. So he's not benefiting from the better economy. Could that change? Yeah, it could change. But it suggests that there's a big gap between the evaluation of President Trump and the evaluation of the economy. And it's the president's approval rating, I think, more than anything else, that determines many of the results in a midterm election. So the opposing party just comes out to paste a defeat on the president they don't like, and the only people on the ballot that they can vote against are the Republicans yeah. on the ballot. So how did the president's approval rating, I don't know, I've seen it 35 to 40, depending on the poll. Uh, if what does he need to get back to to be able to have at least a, a break even or give Republicans a fighting chance to do better? He needs to be about where he was on Election Day, 46 percent, 46, yeah, 45, 45 46 percent. And, and look, Paul, we all learned about polls in 2016. You know, if we if we knew right. the lesson before we relearned it, let's remember, probably there's a non response rate problem for his supporters, for Republicans there don't like the media, don't like polls. And so add two or three points to whatever his approval rating is. That's what I've learned to do. So he's not as far down as some of the polls have him, but he's not as high as he needs to be if Republicans are to hold their own in the midterm elections. Well, for years, Democrats have been complaining about the so-called gerrymanders in the states that make it easier for Republicans to hold the House. You're saying that even that, that, uh, that suddenly is not going to be as powerful for Republicans this time and, and that maybe overcome or, or have, have Democrat complaints maybe been overwrought on that. 
<laughs> no, gerrymandering does have an impact. There's no question. But what, what happens is interesting. If the wave goes high enough, it simply washes over the advantage that gerrymandering gives in specific districts. But is the wave going to be high enough? In Virginia this past November, it was high it enough. Was high uh, enough. The, the, the candidate for governor won by nine points, and it was enough to pull in uh, 50 out of 100 members of the House of Delegates for their party. But, Paul, there were, the Democrats got 55 percent of the popular. Or have, have, have Democrat complaints maybe been overwrought on that? No, gerrymandering does have an impact. There's no question. But what, what happens is interesting. If the wave goes high enough, it simply washes over the advantage that gerrymandering gives in specific districts. But is the wave going to be high? out of 100 members of the House of Delegates for their party. But, Paul, there were... The U.S. economy closing out 2017 on a high note. In addition to the stock market surge, consumer confidence remains strong and unemployment is at its lowest level since 2000. President Trump, optimistic that the boom will continue, tweeted this week, quote, all signs are that business is looking really good for next year, only to be helped further by our tax cut bill. Will be a great year for companies and jobs. Stock market is poised for another year of success. We're back with Dan Henninger. Kim Strassel, Mary Anastasia O'Grady, and James Freeman. So, Mary, it does look to me like the economy, certainly here in the last nine months, has moved up to a new level of growth of about 3% from 2%, the Obama kind of doldrums. Mm -hmm. You agree, and how do you explain it? Yeah, it's looking pretty good. Um, we mentioned before the deregulatory environment. The Trump administration says that they have... Um, deregulated 67 um, former regulations. And do you think that's a, that's a big factor? I do. I do. I think that, um, you know, regulation is, it's empirical that regulation puts a boot on the neck of the U.S. economy. And if you can lighten that, regu you need regulation, but it should be a light regulatory touch. And the Obama administration just went all out on regulation. Um, you also have cheap money. And, uh, you know, the Fed says that they're going back to, you know, they're going to raise interest rates in 2018, but we're just getting back to something normal. And a normal kind of interest rate scenario, I think, will also be helpful for the economy. Okay, and oh, 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 oh. let's stop there for a second. So you don't think that rising rates will necessarily slow down growth? Not if it's, you know, taking the um, Fed funds rate back to something that is historically normal. Obviously, if you start to get into, you know, what it looked like in the 19, early 1980s, that's a different ballpark. We don't have that problem. We don't have an inflation problem. Um, and part of that, a big part of that goes to the private sector because, um, you know, all of the uh, improvements in productivity uh, are part of what holds down inflation while, um, you know, you're able to grow. James, some of our friends on the right, I mean, on the left, rather, uh, Larry Summers, it's called it a sugar high. Yeah. It gets the Fed uh, fueling things, but also, uh, you know, the short-term tax cut, perhaps, anticipation. So it's all phony. What do you think? Yeah, well, keep in mind, a lot of those people were uh, saying in uh, October of 2016 that a Trump win would tank the markets. So we, uh, we have to uh, realize that these are people who've been wrong a lot lately. And what they've especially been wrong about is the idea that uh, the Obama new normal was as good as it gets. Secular stagnation. Secular stag stagnation was the term. And this belief that, uh, that the U.S. economy can't grow the way that it used to. I think we're seeing lately that it can. I think we should expect that will continue because we... We just got a historic, I know we talked about Mr. Trump uh, overstating things, but he did not overstate this is the biggest corporate rate cut ever. We're, we're going back to the corporate income tax rate of roughly 80 years ago. Um, so this is a huge... That's before you were born. A little bit, yes. Yeah, so a huge uh, pro-growth uh, uh, stimulus for the economy. And it's, and it's really the change. To get back to answer your question, we went through a decade roughly where we tried sugar high economics, government intervention in the economy, uh, to, whether it's through the Fed and interest rates or it's government spending. Every year when Obama first came into office, his White House overstated 
overestimated how the economy would grow. Now we're getting back to real economics with people creating jobs. Kim, what about the risks here going forward? And I think there are some. I guess the one I would put at the top of the list is trade policy. If the president comes out and unilaterally pulls out a NAFTA, if he decides to pick a trade war, uh, pick a trade fight with China and it escalates out of control, that could really be a jolt to, to confidence and growth. Yeah, that is by far the biggest risk. I think one of the surprises so far is that the president hasn't uh, implemented some of his worst ideas on trade that he came into office with. There, there have been a few moderating influences there. Uh, pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership was unfortunate. Uh, we'll see where they go from there. Look, I think the other risk is the president spends a lot too much time talking about the stock market and suggesting that that is a measure of the health of the economy. Uh, at some point, that market is probably it's overdue for a correction. It's going to come down. Hopefully, that does not, you know, it's not a bursting of the asset bubble, and that that doesn't have ramifications for the economy as well, too, and confidence out there. Well, that's a, she raised the asset bubble, Dan. I want to talk about that because if you assume that some people have uh, smart economists, that as the Fed was doing what Mary described, it was to uh, explicitly to float asset prices. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's happened. All right, it didn't help so much the overall economy as much as some people hoped, but asset prices are up here. As the Fed normalizes, it, our asset prices, you know, headed for a fall, a correction. They could be headed for a correction. They could be headed for a decline. I don't think we're going to be headed for a asset prices falling off the cliff because the real economy is genuinely strong. And I think that is what is going to be the big political story of 2018. What happens to this economy? Because we have all of these suggestions in 2017. Consumer confidence is at a 17-year high. Unemployment is at a 17-year low. Manufacturing is at a 13-year high. It's as though we have just jumped over the Obama presidency. And so the question now is, will that hold? And if it does, it's going to give a huge boost to this presidency's, pro presidency's prospects. I think what we can be absolutely sure of is when the private sector keeps more of its own money rather than giving it to government, by definition, you're going to have a better investment in growth scenario. Now, things can happen, including North Korea, uh, you know, lots of external factors, but the U.S. economy is going to be better off with more money in the hands of the private sector. Still ahead from Islamic State's defeat in Syria and Iraq to North Korea's nuclear threat, General Jack Keane joins us with a look back at the highs and lows of the year in foreign policy and a look ahead to the biggest global challenges in 2018. Islamic State's defeat in Iraq and Syria to continuing threats from China, North Korea, Russia, and Iran. 2017 saw some foreign policy successes, but also its share of challenges. So did we see the beginnings of a Trump doctrine emerge this year? And what are likely to be the global flashpoints in 2018? Earlier, I spoke with retired four-star General Jack Keane. He's a member of the Commission on National Defense Strategy and a Fox News senior strategic analyst. General Keene, welcome. We're now a year into the Trump presidency. You've seen what they've done in a year. Now we've had their new national security strategy out, which I'm sure you've read. So is there such a thing as an emerging Trump doctrine, and what is it? Yeah, no doubt about that. I mean, I think what we can safely say is that this last year of action culminating in the national security strategy can eliminate any concern that people had about the Trump team being isolationist, disengaging from the world, not appreciating America's global leadership, or not valuing the importance and significance of allies and partners. The reality is the Trump team is promoting American global leadership, returning it to a world stage. And, and what they've been advocating is peace, security, prosperity. They spent the entire year reassuring allies of the same in the Indo-Pacific, in the Middle East, and also in, in Europe. And they've also demonstrated, they haven't had a lot of crises, but they've demonstrated a willingness to confront our, to confront our adversaries in a way that their predecessors you know, were not willing to do. So I, I definitely think there's, there's contours of a, 
of a Trump policy, national security, foreign policy that clearly is right in, right in front of us. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that struck me about the document, the strategy document, was the, the clarity and forthrightness with which they identified threats. They identified China and Russia by name as re revisionist powers who are seeking to upset the global order and uh, undermine U.S. interests. They mentioned North Korea and Iran as two rogue states who are a threat. And of course, then you have the transnational threats. But it's that it, overall, what I, what, I, what I read was they think this is a very dangerous world and getting more dangerous. Do you agree with that? Oh, I, I totally agree with it. I don't think there's a period of time that compares to this. We have to go all the way back to the end of World War II with the rise of the Soviet Union. So when, when Obama wrote their document in the second year, I mean, it, 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 it had all sorts of ambiguity and a lack of clarity about what the problem is, much less what to do about it. This principled realism, as the Trump team uh, calls it, I, I mean, it is refreshing. They are, they are calling it the way it is. We're back in an era of big power competition again, Paul, with Russia, which is a near-term dangerous threat to us, and China, without any equivocation, is our long-term strategic challenge, which I think, given its economic engine and its desire to replace the United States as a preeminent global power in the world, this will occupy American presidents for most of the 21st century as the major, major challenge we have. It will dwarf our challenge with the Soviet Union. And yet, Yes, they've identified the regional threats of North Korea to regional stability along with Iran, and they know that radical Islam is thriving. Sure. Well, and so let's take, let's try to uh, break out some of the differences on specific policies or regions where, other than the rhetoric, where the policies have changed from the Obama era. And I want to uh, push back at you a little bit because as I think about how they've approached Russia, for example, I haven't seen a really big difference with Obama on, say, Syria, for example example, a big change. Now, they've just recently changed and they're going to send lethal weapons, at least moderate lethal weapons to Ukraine, which is a change from Obama. But where's been the other policy shifts from Russia? No. Uh, what what the issues with Russia have been largely rhetoric and enunciation of a change in policy with very little implementation, in my judgment. And when you point to Syria, the real issue in Syria, it's less Russia, it's more Iran. Iran has, is dominating Syria. They have now established a land bridge that the Institute for the Study of War forecasted they would do. I remember. Bet between Iraq, going through Iraq, going through Syria, and going to Lebanon. And, and, and this is a very dangerous situation because Iran fully intends to encroach on Israel. They will begin to bring missiles into Syria. They've got 160,000 in Lebanon. I think it will produce a crisis, maybe in 2018, but certainly likely in 2019, where Israel will have to take some action. And we have no strategy to contain this threat. Okay, I want to look ahead now a little bit on 20. You mentioned that potential Israel-Iran flashpoint. What else should we be looking for? What areas, what countries for potential flashpoints? Well, clearly, the, the crisis in North Korea That's is right. going to come to a showdown in 2018. Really? Director Pompeo. That soon. As, as he has said that they will have the capability in months, not years. Public statement by the director of the CIA. So that tells me that we have a we have a showdown coming. China is still likely the best path for that solution. But listen, I know for a fact that North Korea is pushing coal still into China and getting money in return. Sure. That fuel is still flowing into North Korea despite all the UN sanctions. So there's the economic squeeze in North Korea is not happening. This makes it I mean, not happening to the degree that we want it to. This makes the military option more preeminent and certainly a, a, a very dangerous situation. I, I think in 2018, we have got to craft a new strategy in dealing with China. We got to really use some imaginative statecraft to come up with what this strategy is. The current one is failing miserably, and we're on a collision course. And, he, and here's why. China, China is a rising power and they're trying to overtake a ruling power. That has always led to war, with some few exceptions. We gotta figure out something you know, to avoid that. We also have to figure out, in 2018, how to compete in the gray zone. And what I mean by that is Russia and China both blur the lines between peace and war. And they advance geopolitically by blurring those lines. And we're not doing very well.